Hello and welcome back to Crash Course. Today we're going to be looking at the final part of a neurosensory system and this will involve us taking a look at the motor and sensory tracts as well as the cerebellum and basal ganglia in some detail and finishing off with a summary and some MCQs. So to start with motor versus sensory the tracts. So what's really important is that the motor tracts are made up of an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. So the upper motor neuron comes from the cerebral cortex and it's responsible for conveying impulses for voluntary motor activity through descending motor pathways and they send fibres to the lower motor neurons. As we said they arise from the cortical areas of the brain and then they control lower motor neurons through either the pyramidal tract i.e. the corticospinal tract or the extrapyramidal tract i.e. the reticulospinal, the rubrospinal, vestibulospinal etc. There are also lower motor neurons, so these take over from the upper motor neurons and receive excitation from them. And they're the only neurons that innervate the skeletal muscle fibres. So they function as the final common pathway, in other words, the final link between the nervous system and the skeletal muscle, the effector. Lower motor neurons can be alpha or gamma, and alpha motor neurons innervate extrafusal muscle fibres, so these are the most numerous type of muscle fibre. Um, they're the ones involved essentially in contraction, so stretched and relaxed contractors, as you can see. And gamma motor neurons, these innervate intrafusal fibres, and these are the ones with sensory afferents that compose the muscle spindles. And these are the part which senses our body position, so the proprioception. In terms of nerve fibres, essentially peripheral nerve fibres are grouped based on their diameter, their signal conduction velocity, and how myelinated they are. So A fibres or alpha fibres are the largest fibres and they're myelinated. They're sensory and motor in function and they can be further subdivided into alpha, beta, delta and gamma which are each involved in different stimuli. B fibres are myelinated as well and these however are only in preganglionic sympathetic nerves and they're slower conducting velocity than A but faster than C. C are the smallest fibres, they're unmyelinated, they're mostly in visceral and cutaneous nerve and they're actually quite slow at conducting, particularly in comparison to fibres A and B. The tracts then, so motor tracts are your corticospinal tract and your extrapyramidal tracts and then sensory tracts are your posterior column or dorsal column medial lemniscus, your spinothalamic and your spinocerebellar. And if you've been following this video series you will notice that this slide has come up before in the anatomy section and essentially you've got the sensory fibres on this side just to show you and the motor fibres on this side just to show you and don't forget these are both present on both sides it's just here we're using them on one side to make it clearer to see so first of all let's have a look at the sensory tract so there's more of these to know about so the posterior column tract this is made up of fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus dependent upon the level that the impulse comes into the spinal cord it's responsible for fine touch, vibration and proprioception and the fibres decussate at the medulla oblongata so they come in at the spinal level, they arise through the spinal cord and they decussate at this medulla oblongata. Then we have the spinothalamic and this transmits pain and temperature sensation to the thalamus in the lateral um, cord and then the anterior aspect transmits crude touch and pressure. Spinothalamic is most commonly known for pain and temperature stimulation. Um, passing on. And you can see the difference here, so the anterior tract comes in at the spinal level, it decussates at the spinal level, as does the lateral spinothalamic tract, and when they decussate they then ascend up to the medulla, up to the midbrain, and then up to the thalamus, which uh, passes the impulse on to the cerebral cortex. And again the same happens on this side, but this is the lateral spinothalamic tract, which ascends and gets passed on to the cerebral cortex. Then we have the spinocerebellar tract, so this one's a little bit more simple. It simply transmits proprioception sensations to the cerebellum. This makes sense, of course, as the cerebellum, as we're going to learn in a minute, is all about fine movement and correcting movements, and therefore we want to know about proprioception, we want to know about our body's position, so that the cerebellum can coordinate a response to any incorrect movements. There's a posterior and an anterior tract, and the posterior tract decussates at the spinal level, ascends, and to the cerebellum. The anterior tract decussates at the medulla oblongata. So then we have the motor tracts, so the pyramidal tracts are most commonly known. So this is a corticospinal tract, it's involving conscious control of skeletal muscle. Don't forget now we're descending, so we're going from a cerebral cortex downwards. So the cerebral cortex releases this um, impulse, it passes down, it passes all the way down and decussates at the pyramids in the medulla oblongata through the uh, internal capsule. And then descends down the spinal cord on the contralateral side to where it was released in the brain to the skeletal muscles. Essentially there are anterior and lateral corticospinal tracts and there's also a corticobulbar tract which is responsible for conscious control of the eye, jaw and face muscles. The tracts do decussate as we said at the medulla oblongata and descend down the contralateral side 
to that of where they're released from the motor cortex. Uh, this is really important in terms of clinical relevance, in terms of if we have a lesion in one of the tracts, where the lesion occurs determines where the motor loss will be. The extrapyramidal tracts are made up of the vestibular spinal, the tectospinal, the reticular spinal, and the rubrospinal tract, and each, these each have their own individual functions. So vestibular spinal is all about the inner ear to monitor positions of the head, and therefore can alter muscle tone to adjust this. The tectospinal tract sends information to the head, neck and upper limbs to respond to bright and sudden movements and loud noises. The reticular spinal tract is all about eye movement and respiratory muscles, and the rubrospinal tract sends information to the flexor and extensor muscles. Next we have the cerebellum. So we've referred to this several times as the little brain, the brain, uh, the hind brain, the part that's at the back of the head, and it lies posterior to the pons and medulla and forms a roof of the four ventricles. So the four ventricles here in this diamond shape, and it forms therefore the roof to that. Um, of the posterior aspect of the cerebrum. It facilitates movement by detecting errors that occur within the course of movement and it allows us to correct them and this allows the movement therefore to be completed correctly the next time around that you do it. It's also involved in motor learning to reduce errors in the future. In terms of anatomy there are several ways we can look at the cerebellum but functionally it can be split into two hemispheres and these are the cerebellar hemispheres. The cerebrocerebellum receives input from the cerebral cortex, so involved in planning and initiating movement. The spinocerebellum receives information about proprioception and pressure sensation from the spinal cord, and therefore this adjusts the limb position based on its position to avoid errors. The vermis is a part that runs straight down the middle of the spinocerebellum, and it's involved in posture, limb movements, and eye movements. And the vestibular cerebellum, or the flocular nodular lobe, is important in maintaining balance, equilibrium and posture. So this is a brief overview of the structures of the cerebellum and what they do. It is connected to the brainstem in three parts, and these are called peduncles. So you have the superior cerebellar peduncle connecting with the midbrain, the middle cerebellar peduncle connecting with the pons, and the inferior peduncle connecting with the medulla, which makes sense, of course, as you go down the midbrain, you have midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. The cerebellum essentially has its grey matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. And within the white matter, there are four pairs of nuclei. So let's learn a little bit more about the cerebellar cortex, which we said we'd learn about in this video. And this can be split into three layers. We've got the granular layer, the innermost layer, the cerebellar cortex, and the molecular layer, so that's the outermost layer. So granule cells are excitatory neurons that send their axons to the molecular layer. So the granule cell starts down here. It's an axon ascends into molecular layer and then splits into two, which goes in opposite direction, directions. The axons of the neighbouring granule cells then line up, and these form parallel fibres which run in the molecular layer at a 90 degree to the granule cell axon. The Purkinje cells project dendrites into the molecular layer and axons to the deep cerebellar nuclei. So here's a Purkinje cell. It presents dendrites into molecular layer, so going upwards, and axons deep into the deep cerebellar nuclei. The dendritic trees are at 90 degrees to the parallel fibres and therefore they can run across and meet and form several synapses with the Purkinje cell dendrites. Inhibitory interneurons are also present throughout the cerebellar cortex and these provide inhibition to balance the surrounding circuit. Of course all this is act, um, excitatory and therefore you need inhibitory interneurons as well to contradict some of that. In terms of cerebellar output, the entire output is through the axons of the Purkinje cells, and the axons of the Purkinje cells end by synapsing on the neurons of the deep cerebellar nuclei. The axons of the neurons that form the cerebellar nuclei constitute the efferent outflow from the cerebellum, and a few, few Purkinje cell axons pass directly out of the cerebellum to the lateral vestibular nucleus. The efferent fibres from the cerebellum connect with the red nucleus, thalamus, vestibular complex, and reticular formation. So this is quite a complicated slide. Take it step by step. Um, and try to understand the outputs of the cerebellum. In terms of the input, it receives its input both from the spinal cord and motor cortex, and one method of input to the cerebellum is via mossy fibres. So these synapse onto the cerebellar cortex and onto the deep cerebellar nuclei, and they provide input to the granule cells and give information about voluntary limb movements. Another form of input are climbing fibres, and these come from the inferior olivary nucleus in the medulla oblongata. And the inferior olivary nucleus itself receives input from the spinal cord and motor cortex. So each climbing fibre wraps around Purkinje cells forming synapses, and each Purkinje cell receives input from only one climbing fibre. So the overall functions of the cerebellum, the spinous cerebellum is mainly responsible for control of tone and posture. Equilibrium is mainly under the control of the vestibular cerebellum. 
Next we have control of voluntary movement and this essentially remember the cerebellum receives two types of information. We have the information from the motor cortex and that of the actual movement feeding back to the um, cerebellum and then the difference between the two calculates an error and the corrective output signals are sent out via the brain stem and thalamus and then we have learned new skill voluntary movements in other words we've got those climbing fibers projecting to the Purkinje cells and new skill movement causes a burst in these Purkinje cells uh, this is called a complex spike and this is modified to be remembered next time um, so that you can learn that skilled movement Lastly for this video we have basal ganglia and these are found deep within the cerebral hemisphere. It's made up of a chordate, putamen, globus pallidus, substantia nigra and subthalamic nucleus. And these structures are mainly responsible for facilitating movement but they do have non-motor functions as well. So the basal ganglia functionally can be divided into a striatum, so putamen and chordate, and globus pallidus into the interna and externa aspects. We've also got the thalamus, of course, the subphalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra, which can be broken down into the pars reticularis and the pars compacta. Input to the basal ganglia comes from the cerebral cortex to the striatum, in other words, to your chordate and putamen, and output from the basal ganglia is from the globus pallidus and substantia nigra, and this goes to the thalamus and brainstem. Remember, the basal ganglia does not cause movement. It simply acts on other parts of the brain to influence its activity, in other words, to upregulate or downregulate the pathways. The basal ganglia, so as we said, chordate putamen, globus pallidus, subphalamic nuclei, and substantia nigra. So, in terms of the pathways, we can have a direct or an indirect pathway, and this is what you really need to know about the basal ganglia. The direct pathway is excitatory, it stimulates our cortex, and the indirect pathway does the opposite, it inhibits our cortex. And dopamine is responsible for modulating the balance between the two. So dopamine, remember, is a neurotransmitter, and depending on what receptor it acts on, it causes either increased activity of the direct pathway or decreased activity of the indirect pathway. So first of all, we've got the direct pathway. So from the cortex, we have excitation to the striatum, and therefore inhibition to the globus pallidus interna and to the substantia nigra pars reticularis. This causes inhibition to the thalamus, and therefore this causes excitation to the cortex. So, keeping all this in mind, if we want to cause excitation, we stimulate the direct pathway. It excites the striatum, causes inhibition of the globus pallidus and substantia nigra, and when these are inhibited, therefore their output is reduced and therefore they're less, enable, less able to inhibit the thalamus, in which case the thalamus is not inhibited, and therefore the thalamus output therefore reaches the cortex and it can excite the neurons. I appreciate this is quite a complex um, aspect, but compare the wordy slide with the um, diagram slide and do the same exactly for the indirect pathway, uh, and it will make a lot more sense, I promise. Uh, in terms of the indirect pathway, it's just a little bit longer, and that's predominantly why it's inhibitory. It almost has to go around the houses to get to exactly the same place as the direct pathway, and therefore it's the inhibitory pathway. Like I say, compare the wordy slides and the diagram slides and try and use them together. If you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. In order of summary, we have got some questions to see what you've learned. These are questions that were asked at the start, so I'm not going to spend ages on them. So with regards to the cell body, what direction does a dendrite carry the impulse? Hopefully now you know dendrites carry impulses towards the cell body, axons carry them away. Question two, thinking about repolarization, what happens? Hopefully now you know sodium is responsible for depolarization, potassium is responsible for repolarization. Question three, the parasympathetic nervous system keeps us alert and prepared for fight and flight response. Hopefully by the end of now, we will realise it is the sympathetic nervous system that's all about fight and flight response. It is the parasympathetic nervous system that controls resting and digesting. And two harder MCQs. So the striatum of the basal ganglia is made up of is it the chordate and putamen, the chordate and globus pallidus, putamen and subphalamic nucleus, or thalamus and subphalamic nuclei. And remember, the striatum is the input of the basal ganglia, so this is the chordate and putamen. The chordate and putamen is our striatum, which modulates the input of the basal ganglia. The lateral spinothalamic tract, what does it carry? So remember, the spinothalamic is an ascending tract, it's sensory, so is it pain and temperature to the cerebellum, proprioception to the thalamus, pain and temperature to the thalamus, or light touch to the cortex? And hopefully here you now recall that the spinothalamic tract carries pain and temperature to the thalamus. So that concludes this series on the anatomy and physiology of the neuro system. If you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I appreciate there is a lot to cover in the neuro system and it was almost rushed through it in these videos. But please do take it step by step um, at your own pace and hopefully you will make your way through it. 
I hope you found these videos useful and as always if you do have any feedback please do let me know and any questions please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for listening.